Well, uh, as far as connecting to the divine, if, if all of the listeners right now would go to their phones and get their cash app up and so into my ministry, a love offering of <laughs> Hang on, but what's what's your what's your Venmo address, man? Let me uh, see if I can. I want a blessing, brother. Western Christianity has spent the last two thousand years telling everyone they're separated from God. This is not church with John and Nat Turney. All right, everybody, we are back with our podcast here. Welcome back to This Is Not Church. Today we are uh, joined with our good friend Kyle Butler. I, I'm going to give Kyle Butler a, a kind of a bio of my own. Um, I've I've only known Kyle through Facebook. Uh, we've met through Facebook through some mutual friends. What, what what I really really like about what Kyle's doing right now, and what really kind of inspires me as we move forward in this in this podcast and in what we're doing is just Kyle's uh, just his love for all people. And I mean, we're going to get into the conversation here a little bit. And, but I just want everyone to understand that Kyle has, has been someone there. I mean, he doesn't know me. He's never met me in person, but he's someone who reaches out and, you know, lets me know, you know, when I have, when I, when I post stuff, he's one of the first people to make some comments. He, he comments on it. He uh, basically is just there to show everybody that, Hey, you are loved right where you are. You don't need to worry about your past. You don't need to worry about where you're going. It's just, it, it's, and, and I'm just, I'm just pleased as punch to be able to talk to him today. So uh, welcome, Kyle. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you both so much for having me on. I, it's a real, pro, it's a real pleasure and a treat. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, I forgot to introduce my brother. My brother is here with us uh, as always. Nat Turney. Say hi, Nat. Hi, Nat. <laughs> this is going to become a thing, isn't it? We're, we're not going to keep doing this, are we? No, we're not. We're not going to keep doing that. <laughs> yeah, try and stop me. All right. So I'm just going to, I just want to jump right into this because uh, I think uh, it's it's important to get this message out that Kyle is kind of putting out on Facebook. And uh, I just want to start out just by asking you, you're a former pastor, correct? Correct. So, I mean, so can you just kind of run us through the process that um, brought you from where you were and the steps that you went through to get to where you are now with this? Uh, I don't want to keep just calling it unconditional love, but I mean, I mean, that's that's the basis of it. But there's way more to it than that. And uh, can you just kind of step us through that process and how you got to where you are? Sure. You know, I, I, I started going to church as a little boy when my mom had her from the Jesus moment, if you will. And, uh, you know, I, I, it was a Pentecostal holiness church and they most certainly believed in church. We went to church almost every day. It felt like as a kid, right. We're always in church. And, uh, I grew up in, in that environment and it was, it became so much of our life, what we did and who we were and, Everything changed for us, and, and the church became a huge, huge part of all that. And I guess early on, I started to develop my understanding of what was happening and what was being said. And I seemed to have had, as a kid, a, a good enough understanding of what grown-ups were always talking about. So you know, it, it, I wasn't just like aloof to what was being said. And, and very early on, uh, based upon the things I was hearing, God scared me. I was I was definitely afraid of God early on, and oh. that, that carried me through my early teenage years. And you know, our church believed in the age of accountability, so I remember hearing multiple times in Sunday school. And you know, by the time you're 13, if you don't get saved by 13, and you know, after that, 12 years. If something happens to you, you're going to go to hell. Now, I was already definitely afraid of the devil, and I was definitely afraid of hell. So at 13, on my first week of being 13, I was at that altar giving my life to Jesus, crossing that T and dotting that I. And I was so uncertain of that process, I went back three straight weeks <laughs> oh. <laughs> to make sure, you know, I got it right because I didn't feel any different, you know. Me too. <laughs> I didn't feel any different. Yeah. I wanted yeah. to make sure I had, I had, I had 
got that done. And, um, you know, even though I had did that, it didn't alleviate any of the fear I had for God. So the next big decision I made towards God was at 19, because I had also heard growing up in this church that if you don't do what God wants you to do, God will make you do it. He will force you to do it. He'll put some calamity on you. He'll strike you down. He'll do something to get your attention and force you to do what he wants. And so at 19, after receiving what I thought at the time, multiple words being spoken over me from 13, 14, 15 on through, that God had a call on my life, that God wanted to use me, that you know ministry was God's choice for me and all those things. At 19, I decided, well, I, I don't want to you know, take God off any more than he probably is already mad at me for being a teenager. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I should go ahead and, and get sold out for God. So at 19, I, you know, I, I thought that's the best thing for me to do. And I dove in, I rolled up my sleeves and and gave it, started giving it my all. Became totally sold out for God, or what I would like to say, a young Pharisee. Dug into all things God, all things Bible, all things prayer, all things church, all things worship, all things, all things that were, that was, had become so much part of my life. So I went through that whole thing. And, you know, two years after that, I was being ordained as a minister. And then two years after that, I was being ordained again as an elder. And then two years after that, the pastor who had founded the church and mentored us all these years said, Hey, I'm going to South Carolina. The church is going to be yours. And at 26 years old, Really knowing nothing, I started that journey as a pastor, and I went through the I went through the motions. It was really all motions. It, it was no emotion involved. It was no love involved. It was all motions. I just thought I had to do it because if not, God was going to get me. So about two thousand, uh, I started having some you know reckonings within myself. And if I'm honest, I like to I like to always say. When I look back on all those years, I never felt, it never felt right to me. It never connected with me. It, it, it always felt like a chore. It always felt like a requirement. It always felt like something I had to do and I had no choice. And if I wanted to one day finally get into God's graces, then I just better just keep going along. About 2000, I started you know, s- slowly paying attention to the rumblings inside of me. Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel so disconnected? Why do I feel like something's wrong with me? And little by little, I started changing some of the, you know, moving away rather from some of the philosophies that I had grown up with. But fast forward to 2007, after again, just going through the motions for the past seven years, doing my churchly pastorly duties, you know, I had an awakening to what I thought at the time was faith. So I, I, I started to d- dive into the word of faith and I thought, okay, this is it. This is why I haven't made it yet because I haven't learned how to fully trust God's word. And I dove into that and then that led me into the grace camp. And when I, I remember when I, when I started learning about grace, I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is, this is where we should have always been. Like, why were we ever doing that other stuff? Like this, this is the meat and potatoes of it all. And, um, you know, and I became a gracer and right. the new covenant and all that stuff. And that was fine for a while. It, it was it was freeing me. It was giving me liberty that I never had before. And it was slowly, you know, allowing me to, to understand love a little bit. Now, none of these years prior to this did I understand anything about God's love. Yeah, I knew what the Bible says, God is love and God's will love the world and blah, 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 blah. But... None of that resonated with me. None of it felt real to me. None of it felt like a real relationship. But grace kind of helped me get into that love package a little bit. And before long, probably about 2010, 2011, I began to, you know, get a sense of there's more to this love thing than you realize. And I remember just, I allowed myself to start thinking again, and I had stopped doing that years ago. I just went along with whatever I heard and whatever I was told. <laughs> and when I started thinking, some of the, the fundamental 
cornerstone beliefs um, that had grounded me or thought grounded me really stopped making sense. Because as I was getting this sense of how loved I was and how loved everyone was, I couldn't reconcile this love that I was starting to understand with this, you know, this terror that I had known for so long. I couldn't under, I couldn't reconcile it anymore. It, it didn't make sense to me anymore. Um, and so right. once yeah. that started tearing yeah. down, and I really just told myself, I'm going to just follow what I'm feeling inside and what I'm hearing inside. And that just opened up the floodgates to what I now call pure, unconditional judgment, free love. And just how loved we are, we've always been, and how we have nothing to fear and how Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's amazing. Uh, I mean, your journey and my journey, even though I think people are going to kind of get bored of hearing this about me, but this 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 30 year gap of me being completely out of church, your your journey uh, mirrors mine in so many ways that it's it's just uncanny. I mean, when I was younger, yeah, that fear of God, that monster God, the God that was there to judge you, uh, tell you what you're doing wrong. Um, you're constantly, yeah. I mean, I, I, I know Nat can agree with this. I, I cannot even count how many times I recommitted my life to Jesus yeah. mm-hmm. or went up to the altar to be born again, again, again. I mean, Nat and I <laughs> went to church camp every summer and every summer I was up to that altar crying my eyes out saying, you know, this time, this time I'll do it. This time I'll be better. And then I'd leave church camp and I'd go back into my regular life and I'd realize I can't keep up with this. I can't, I can't do what they expect of me and I'd fail again. And what do you think, Nat? I mean, are you kind of in agreement with that? Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I rode the altar until my thirties, man. You know, <laughs> that was, that was the deal. I mean, until, um, until I got a glimpse of what Kyle's talking about right now, which is the fact that the standards we were holding up for ourselves weren't even God's standards. They were our standards. So projecting our expectations onto some divine entity that we had no clue about and saying, well, I must be disappointing him because I'm sure as hell disappointing myself was what drove me crazy and scared the hell out of me. All, all at the same time, because this was the God who was going to, you know, dangle me over the fires and, you know, burn me like a like, you know, with like a kid with a magnifying glass, you know, on an anthill <laughs> or do a Jonathan Edwards thing. And I'm a loathsome spider that, you know, anyway, I had a question for you, though, brother, because I listened to a, a little bit of your um, I, I follow you on Facebook, obviously, but I watched one of your videos just this morning. And one thing you said in particular struck me as a theme that if the church would grab we might could get rid of some of this stuff for good. And you mentioned um, talking about being a divine entity. Yeah. And, and before people get crazy and go, oh, my gosh, uh, it's biblical. <laughs> right. It's yeah. biblical. We are um, we are partakers of the divine nature. We're participants in this thing with Jesus. And so I wanted to, my, my question for you is twofold. One is how do we how do we reckon ourselves with this divine nature, become participants in it? And to what degree have we bought into this lie of separation that puts us in a place where we're constantly striving to achieve that which has already been given? Well, uh, as far as connecting to the divine, if, if all of the listeners right now would go to their phones and get their cash app up 
and so into my ministry a love offering of <laughs> Hang on, what, what's what's your what's your Venmo address, man? Let me uh, see if I can. I want a blessing, brother. Don't, don't you know? And God will make that connection for you. <laughs> oh my you know, I, that was awesome. That, I love it. <laughs> I, I wanted to say it that way because. So much of every, all of our programming is based on something we have to do. Right. And that have been so deeply embedded in us and conditioned in our thinking, it's nearly impossible for the, what, you know, no offense to anyone, what I would call the average Christian, it would, it's nearly impossible for them to think that they are divine as is. And I think... Christianity in general, and I'm, you know, I, I don't bash anything. I try my best not to bash anything. But what I like to say happens is I'm looking at it now objectively since I'm no longer intimately connected with it. So I'm looking back on my own journey, my own experience, and I'm being objective. I, I'm not a defender. You know, I'm not trying to defend these narratives that don't make any sense. I'm not trying to defend any doctrine or theology that doesn't fit any realities. So as I look back on it, you know, objectively, what I see with Christianity is, in most all religions probably, is that they thrive on the belief that you need something in order to be. And this thing you need is outside of yourself. And something must happen for you to be connected with it, but you're not really connected with it because your connectivity to it is going to be entirely based upon how much of yourself you continue to give to this thing over the rest of your lifetime. And, you know, Christianity fits in that mold. But the problem is that it doesn't want you to understand your divinity doesn't want you to understand your oneness. It doesn't want you to understand how good you are and how perfect you are and how your nature is divine. It doesn't want you to really understand that because it under, I think it, it, it understands also that the day you really understand that, the day you will say, I don't need you anymore. I don't need to be beholden to you that way. I don't need to serve you that way anymore. So it doesn't really want you to know that. But there's no person, as I see it, that came here that lives a life that is not a divine being. The only thing is, not everyone understands it and knows it and sees it. I didn't know it. I was saved for 30 plus years, whatever I thought saved was. And no one ever told me I was a divine being. And they told me how bad I was, though. They told me how much of a sinner I was, though. They told me I just wasn't kept it, though. They told me I wasn't anointed enough, though. They told me I wasn't praying enough, though. They, they told me all that, and I, I believe it all. But no one, no one ever told me I was a divine being. They told me that, you know, you get Jesus, and you know what? You'll, you'll be just about okay, but you still got a hell of a lot of work to do. So I think we're just lacking the knowledge of who we really are and there's nothing we have to do to be it we just have to you know if we have to do anything i guess it's just acknowledge it or just come to a place of knowing and that for me happened all internally it, it happened internally it, i decided to push aside all of the things that i had become so passionate about and completely trust what was happening inside of me. What was I hearing? What was I sensing? What was I feeling? And I would hear things that would totally contradict everything that I thought I knew. I would, I would get a sense of a knowing like, yes, this is it. And I would just know it would be, it was as if I had always known. It was instinctive. And, um, you know, then slowly I, I, I started to try to talk about some of these things. And of course, there's a kickback and the rejection and all those kind of things. And I understand why, because and the average Christian has been convinced to believe that they're not good enough and they lack something. But I think that's changing. 
there's, there's this consciousness that's always been here. And it, it appears that humanity is quickly or more rapidly ascending in this higher consciousness. And this higher consciousness is making us aware just how connected we all are and who we really are. And that is something that I'm starting to see happening. People call it an awakening or an awareness or whatever, but it's starting to happen more and more and more, more quickly than it's ever happened before. And we're dropping all of the things that we thought we had to cling, cling on to, and we're just accepting that we are. And um, for everyone that's listening, maybe you've been there, maybe you feel inadequate, maybe you feel like you're disconnected, but that's only because that's what you've been told all of your journey. You've been told how you have to get on your knees and get on the altar and, and connect with God or rededicate yourself or, you know, that you've been guilted into believing that if you didn't get up every morning and pray that, you know, you've forsaken God or God has forsaken you. And none of those things are true because you came here as a divine being only connected to the source of all love, the source of all things, the source of all life. This is who you are. You've always been this. You exist because of that source, that love, that life. So you are it in itself. You just have to acknowledge it as far as dropping all of the other pretenses and just be willing to say, to yourself, within yourself, yes, I am such. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Uh, again, just like mic drop. Uh, uh, only thing I would ask, and, uh, you know, because again, I, I follow you on Facebook. Uh, I see your posts. And how do you stay this positive within some of the stuff that's going on um, in, in the world, in our country? Some of this, the horrific stuff that's happened over the last couple of years. Uh, actually longer. I mean, I'm just, I'm using, you know, a more current example of some stuff that's been going on for you know far too long in this country. How do you stay so focused on, yes, but I'm going to love everybody unconditionally anyway, without going, you know, F this. Uh, I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to be nice to you anymore. How do you, how do you do that? Honestly, <laughs> well, I, I can't say that it's it's something that I've always had. I was, as I said earlier, I was the young Pharisee. I was a judgmental SOB to the max. And because I thought that's what God wanted. I thought God wanted a rule keeper, a, you know, a staunchly, you know, faithful, dedicated person who would Thus saith the Lord, and this is what God wants, and this is how we're going to do it. And I, unfortunately, because of that, I shunned people I love. I shunned family members and mistreated my sisters and my brother, mistreated friends who I had known all my life up until that point. I, I held them to standards that I thought were holy standards, and if they weren't meeting them, you got the coldest shoulder from me ever. These are people I lived with all my life and loved, you know, with everything I knew inside of me. But I was so blinded by the religiosity that I was being indoctrinated with that I just thought I was right. And when they get themselves right, then they can get my love again. One day, I remember my sisters were over the house and, and I heard, you know, every time you see your sisters, tell them you love them. And, you know, it wasn't it wasn't anything that I didn't love them. I just never really thought about it that way. So I said, I, I, I can do that. I mean, they are my sisters. I do love them. You know, so every time I would see them, I just tell them I love them. I love you. I love you. I love you. And that started something inside of me. And over time, I stopped seeing what I thought they were doing so wrong. And I started to see them again as my beloved sisters. And I guess that's kind of how it, it started. Just... You know, in a, well, as the the understanding and my embracing of myself as being loved unconditionally and I have nothing to fear. One day I remember I went outside and I just saw people differently. You know, I, I saw people who 
previously I saw is, you know, I live in an urban town, so it's very easy to walk out in certain parts of the neighborhood and see people that are strung out on drugs or coming out of alcohol, you know, coming out of uh, liquor stores totally bummed at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning. Easy to see, you know, street walkers and people that are just out, just doing nothing, just wasting their life away, so to speak. It's easy to drive on some some blocks and see young boys outside with their you know, pants sagged down, selling drugs, and you know, you know that's what they're doing. And and I would drive these streets and look on these people with great disgust. But one day, I remember well, the first time I went outside and I saw everyone as beloved, and I started saying to myself as I saw the same people, highly beloved of the Father. Highly beloved of the Father, highly beloved of the Father, highly beloved of the Father, I was saying, as I saw these people now. And that really began to change how I see others. So as it relates to what's happening around us in the world and all this stuff, yeah, I see it. And sometimes it hurts. It really does. But I am, I am undoubtedly convinced that love is our answer. I'm totally convinced that no matter what, the pains might be that I experience or others experience at times and not, not trying to, you know, mediate them that they don't, like they don't matter. But I'm convinced that no matter what the challenges are, we can find a way to still love. And if we, if we can do that, and if we will do that, I believe it's the pathway to not only healing and restoration, but, you know, how humanity really begins to treat one another. And I know it's tough at times. We just came through a very tough climate of, you know, a lot of negativity and a lot of confusion and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hurt, a lot of death, a lot of destruction, a lot of things that were, you know, first timers for us. We're coming out of this pandemic and we've been, you know, excluded and kind of roped off from our friends and loved ones for so long. And it's been a tough time for a lot of people. But I still believe the power of love. And I still believe we can capture the heart of people by just being willing to show them love. And do people sometimes tick me off on my post? Sure. You know, do sometimes I want to write back and tell them how dumb I think they are? Sure. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, there's a bigger part of that in me that says respect them where they are. Give them the grace that you give yourself. And let's see where this takes us. Well, I, I hope we can take that to heart because uh, from where I sit, we're so divided. You know, we're so divided along racial lines, eth you know, ethnic lines, sexual orientation, identification, whatever you want to call it. And we have stopped seeing each other as first and foremost, as you said, beloved divine beings, you know, people who are beloved by the Father. And for some reason that, that, that what strikes me is this, and I want to get your take on this because I've said this for a little while now, but I don't believe there's any such thing as conditional love because the second you place conditions on love, it ceases to be love. And so is there something to this thing of, I am going to extend love universally without expectation of it being reciprocated? I hope it will, you know, because it really only truly functions when it flows back and forth, but it's not going to stop me from doing my part. But I, I used to use love more as a transaction. You know, it was currency. And so I would say, listen, I love you. And so for so long as you love me back, you can continue to be worthy of my love. But, uh, you know, piss me off and I'm going to I'm going to say, well, we're done with this. Um, how does that play out? And And my. My other big question then is how do you then guard your heart against the inevitable onslaught? Because people are going to abuse that love, take it for granted, refuse it. But how do you protect yourself from becoming damaged in the process? Or do you? Well, I think I think one thing that it that I, I try to focus on is okay, if, if I'm gonna start with unconditional love as my foundation. And then I need to really understand how and what unconditional love is, how, how I understand it. So the very first thing I need to do for me is try to take my, 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 offense, my ability to be offended out of the equation. So for theological and doctrinal and, you know, political or whatever differences I may have with people, 
for me, what I said, okay, Kyle, you're going to respect everyone where they are because no one is their belief. We're not our beliefs. We may hold them now. We may have held them before. We may hold different ones in the future. We're not really our beliefs. So you're going to, you're going to, and allow people to, to think how they feel, to to have the, the right just like you do, to see it how you see it. And you don't have to go into their mind and live there. I don't have to live in your mind. If you believe that and that gives you peace, then I don't have to live there. I live over here in my mind where I'm at at peace. I started, you know, Logically, convincing myself, okay, that's where you need to start. You don't have to live in other people's minds or beliefs. You, you have yours. You stay in yours and let them stay in those. They obviously feel that way and they believe it. And then how do I not, you know, how, do, how do I not get hurt and, and, and try not to get hurt is, I, I do understand, I do believe that, that love has to also have a certain intelligence about it where I'm, 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 I'm going to try not to put myself in environments where I can potentially be hurt just because I want to go there to love people. I heard a story once about a young, and it's not too long ago, this young missionary, and he was so on fire for God or crazy for Cocoa Puffs or something, but um, he, he wanted to go into this remote village. And he was determined to go into this remote village where historically it was known that they do not allow outsiders in this village. They don't. And they would kill all outsiders that would try to come in. And this man, this young guy, you know, this was so determined he's going to go into that village and win these people to Jesus. Well, he went in that village and they killed him. They killed him. And uh, I remember watching this and thinking, wow, guy was a little crazy. You know, he, 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 he believed his love was driving him into this place where these people, in his eyes, needed to be rescued and saved. Well, I don't know if that's love. <laughs> you know? I, don't, I don't know if that's love. So, yeah, I would, I would tell people, you know, don't, don't put yourselves in, in positions where you're going to be hurt because you think that you got to go in there and try to save the day or, or extend some type of supernatural love to environments and people where you know they're not going to receive it. Because love also says, you know what, I'm going to protect myself as well. And maybe there's a day where you and I can sit down and have dialogue about certain things without one of us getting hurt. Maybe that day will come. But until that day comes, I'm going to not violate you and then not violate me as well. So I try to look at it like that. Does it always work? Not all the time, because I'm still, you know, I'm still learning and, and, just, and discovering and developing in, in this whole thing myself. And yeah, sometimes it is, it is a little bit of a challenge. You know, I'm not going to present myself as perfected this, but I've gotten a lot better. And I do strive to be even a better person of love for all. Well, I mean, I, I really resonate with this, this idea of, you know, you have to, you have to learn to love yourself because if you don't love this person, the person you are, you don't have the ability to then project that love out. Right. So, and I, and I, and I suffer you know, and I think uh, I think most people who were raised in the type of church that we we've been talking about do suffer from this um, level of self loathing, self hatred, you know, whatever you want to call it. So it, it creates this anger, right? This anger in you because you don't feel like you've measured up, and I can't speak for other people. I can only speak for myself. And the, and the response of that is, I don't, I don't keep that inside. I project that. I project that out onto everybody else. So instead of me taking care of what I think is my, my problem, I find those problems in other people. And then I point them out and I make them, I make them the problem, not me. So what's the steps? If you know, I mean, what are the steps to finding that inner peace, that love of yourself? I mean, I, I understand what you're saying with the, uh, you know, finding the divine within yourself, but I mean, what's the first step of that? 
I mean, how do you even start that? I have a really good friend, um, Kent Etter. I think he, he told me something once that was really a, a open door into this, where I am. We were on the phone once and he said, Kyle, I, I don't think people understand or really appreciate probably the greatest verse in the Bible. So I'm thinking he's going to say John 3, 16, or you know, I can do all things to Christ or something. And he says, you know, it's, it's um, Deuteronomy 26 and 10, I believe it is. But the, the, the one that says, be still and know. Now, I had known that verse, yeah. be still and know I'm God. So I've only ever related that to God. Like, okay, well, like, whenever things get crazy, I got to get still and, and know God is going to take care of it or get in control of a situation. I got to, you know, settle myself. So let God be God and, you know, I'll go in the background. But he, he, he stopped at be still and know. And that's, that's all he said. And he said, if, if, if humanity will, will, will understand just how important that is, it'll change everyone's life. Be still and know. And says, Carla, I try to get myself as still as I can for a few moments every day without thought. And it's really hard to do. Try to get still as I can without thought and just try to hear what I hear from the inside. And, you know, it was, it was so, it was so, it captured me so deeply, like, hmm, I want to know what that's like. So I started to try to just get still enough. And I just I would start off in these five minute intervals or, you know, or I would start off to see how long I can still myself without a lot of thoughts running through my mind. Well, eventually what started happening is I would, I would get still and then I would start to hear things like you're one with love. You're one with peace. You're one with joy. You're one with help. You're one with prosperity. You're one with, you know, and it would just, it would just hearing these things. And I was too afraid to utter them because I never heard anything like this before. I heard people say, you can have joy. You can have peace. You can have happiness. You can have, but everyone's here. I never heard anything say you are actually one with these things. And every time I would get still, I would hear something like that. And then it started escalating. One day it said, you're one with spirit. And I thought, okay, Kyle, you don't, you don't got some psychedelic stuff here. You, 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 there's no way you're one with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's like, you know, crazy one-on-one. Get out of here. You might have a little bit of the Holy Spirit, but no way you're one with it. But, I, you know, I, for some reason I just kept going with it, and it just kept elevating, it kept elevating. Then one day I heard, you're one with God. And I was like, okay, you know, that that's really where I drew the line. Now, prior to that, I had gained confidence to start saying these things. So I would be in that meditative moment for a few moments and I'd start hearing these things and I would start uttering them. I'm one with love. I'm one with peace. And then I had really started to believe it. Like, yeah, I'm one with love. I'm one with peace, whatever. And then I finally got the courage to say I'm one with spirit. And it just, you know, it just kept going. And then that day when it said you're one with God, I was like, okay. I'm not saying that because God's going to kill me. <laughs> I'm going to die here in this room today. I say that. <laughs> but I kept hearing it. And one day I had the courage to utter it. I'm one with God. And it was the quietest of whispers. But I said it. And then the next day I said it again. And then the next day I said it again. And then eventually I got to the point it became so easy to say it and to feel it and to know it, to be without any doubt about it. So I would encourage people, that's the key, I believe. And I don't, I don't, I try not to tell anyone a formula because everyone's different. But I think the, the one commonality of it all is getting still enough to hear from within what you need to hear to get you going to where you can see yourself and know yourself as that divine being perfectly loved by pure, unconditional love, judgment-free love. That's awesome. I remember once hearing, um, and I can't remember now if it was Brian Zond, maybe. For, you know, apologies to Brian if I got this wrong, but it was either him or maybe Brad Jersack or somebody, but they had taken that verse 
and they had broken it down and they use it as a form of contemplative prayer. And so they would say, be still and know that I am God. Pause. Be still and know. And pause. Be still. And pause. And then the last thing is just, just be. Because there's something about simply being that we miss because so much of religion, the entirety of religion is not about being. It's always about doing. It's always about achieving so that you can be something else rather than being first and having that being inform everything that you do, right? And so we've done the cart before the horse thing for so long that I've said, man, I have to do A, B, C, X, Y, and D so that I can be rather than, hey, I am a divine, perfectly loved, uh, perfectly accepted by the creator of the universe person. And because I know that, I can then extend that same love to people and actually be this person that I strive to be so much more with, with so much less effort, right? So much less cognitive dissonance. So I've actually incorporated that into my own quiet time, whatever you want to call that. And just, it's, it's amazingly peaceful when you get to that be. Oh, okay. So, and so much of, I mean, I, I, for, for me, a lot of this is so Gnostic, right? It's so, there's so, you know, there's this separateness to, you know, whatever this life is and whatever life I aspire to be. And, but there's always this division uh, well, spirit over body. And, you know, that's how the, the whole Gnostic thing works and the special revelation and the, all the other garbage. But what is refreshing about what you, what I hear you say and what I hear, and actually what's really refreshing, Kyle, is that I, I don't hear this just from you. I am hearing this from broader circles, which is awesome, which means to me, there is a, a universality to the truth that's like, okay, we're all kind of awakening to some of this, but it's refreshing that people are just being given permission to find something sacred in all the ordinariness of life, right? We're not, we're not, we're not out there seeking, like, I, you probably did this. I know I did um, in, in, in part of my journey. I was looking for an experience, man. I needed God to show up in a big way at this place. We played the right song. We hit the right chord. Holy <laughs> Ghost spell, rubies dropped from the ceiling, you know, and we were forever chasing that next religious high. <laughs> yeah. And then the inevitable crash after, because my normal life was just crap. Oh, I got to get to the next mountaintop because I don't want to live down here in the, and, and one of those things that I have learned to grapple with is the, is the beauty of the mundane, you know, the, 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 the sacredness of, of a conversation or a shared meal or, anything else that I would have said before was, well, that's not sacred. That's just, that's just life. Life is sacred, man. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. And I, I, man, I, I love that about you and what you're doing that there's, and I, and I love also, and I appreciate your, your hesitancy to make it formulaic. Like we talked about with Michelle Collins yesterday. Um, so my, all of this is so individual and learning to accept people where they are and not cast judgment because they're not on the same part of their journey as you are on yours. Um, you have to come back um, when we've got a little bit more time because there's about 20 other things that we didn't get a chance to to, to run through. And I, I just I could listen to you talk all day anyway. So I really could. I appreciate you coming on the on the, on the podcast. And I, I know John does, too. So I appreciate your perspective and just what you're putting out into the world. We can't have enough of that positivity. I don't think we can stop reminding people how much they're loved. So thank you for that. Uh, the only thing I would say is um, just make sure uh, we have ways of connecting with you. If people want to connect with you, I know you're on Facebook. Uh, I know that you run some video. I, I think you're, are you, are you still on YouTube? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if, 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 if people would like to, if they go to Kyle L Butler.com, Kyle L Butler.com, there you'll find all of my links, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and such. And the best ways to, you know, kind of keep in, touch with me or follow me or whatever. Uh, Facebook is my main platform. I use that mostly. We have a show on Monday nights. I do with uh, Lynn Bennett called The Grace Line. I'm, I'm working on him to try to change that name, but he loves that Grace Line name. <laughs> and, uh, so that's actually, you can find me definitely every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And, you know, I, I try to 
I'm not, I haven't done as many videos as I normally, uh, as I had been doing before. So I, I'll drop a video every so often, but it's really, you know, short little videos just to inspire people, encourage people and motivate people, get them to see themselves and look into themselves for themselves, maybe for the first time. And I tell you what, everyone listening, if you do that, you're going to be amazed at what you see. You're going to be amazed at how great you are, what you start to see your greatness and start to see how capable you are at loving others and yourself. You're going to be amazed at what you see when you start to look within you. And I, I strongly encourage you to start now. All right, man. Well, I, I, again, I just want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Uh, we love you, brother. Uh, we are so happy to have you here. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, we will talk soon for sure. All right. Yeah, thank you, guys. Love you both. Thank you so much. Thanks, bud. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to This Is Not Church. Be sure to rate and review the podcast on your platform of choice. If you would like to partner with us, visit patreon.com slash this is not church where you will receive exclusive content such as early access to episodes, videos of upcoming episodes, and live Q&A sessions. Be sure to check out our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter and Instagram. All the links are in the show notes. We'll be back soon with another episode.